It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. Our phone lines are open. If you have a Bible-related question, give us a call now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hi friends, would you like to hear an amazing fact? Antibiotics like penicillin are chemicals effective at killing or stopping the growth of a microscopic disease causing bacteria. Ironically, history's greatest miracle drug was discovered quite by accident. In 1928, Alexander Fleming, Scottish physician and microbiologist, returned from vacation to his messy laboratory at St. Mary's Hospital in London, and he noticed something odd. He left some plates with bacteria cultures on a bench in the corner. On examination, he noticed one of them was growing mold. Fleming observed that the bacteria nearest to the mold growing was dying. Something in the mold was killing the bacteria. Fleming discovered the mold was penicillium, one of the top three most common airborne fungi. It took years before his discovery was refined by others, tested and manufactured on a mass scale. Before penicillin, the number one killers in the world were things like tuberculosis, pneumonia, diarrhea, scarlet fever, meningitis, infections from wounds, or even surgery. Penicillin's ability to cure people of what were once fatal bacterial infections has saved over 200 million lives. It's easy to understand why it's called a miracle drug. You know, it tells us, Pastor Ross, in the Bible that there is a substance infinitely more powerful than the strongest antibiotics. That's correct, Pastor Doug. It is something that can not only clear, uh, cure sickness, but more importantly, the sickness of, of sin. That's and right. to eternal death. And of course, we're talking about the blood of Christ, the cross. Amen. You can read a couple of scriptures here. Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then there's another powerful verse in Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of of his grace. I remember Pastor Ross when I first started looking into the Christian religion, I, I thought, well, it's kind of gory. They talked about power in the blood and saved by the blood and washed by the blood. And I thought, this is a bloody religion. And but then I came to understand that, you know, the Bible says a life is in the blood. And Christ in giving his blood, he gave his life. And we are washed by his life. And we are healed and empowered by his life and his sacrifice of his life. And so, um, in a sense, he, he gives us a transfusion of his purity uh, to heal us from our disease. So, in that sense, the blood of Christ washes away our sin. And uh, maybe there's some people listening out there that think, I'm, I need healing. I need salvation and forgiveness for my sins. And uh, I think I could use a dose of that cure. We have a free offer that talks about that. We do. A book is entitled... The High Cost of the Cross. And we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. That's our free offer this evening, so take advantage of it. All you need to do is just call the number 800-835-6747. You can ask for offer number 156 or just ask for it by name, The High Cost of the Cross. It explains the gospel and shares good news. If you'd like to get a digital version of the book, just dial pound 250 with your smartphone Again, just say Bible Answers Live and then say High Cost of the Cross. That's pound 250 with your phone and ask for that free gift. You know, Pastor Doug, probably one of the most important truths that we find in Scripture centers on the cross, centers mm -hmm. on that sacrificial death of Jesus and uh, just such an important truth. Amen. And we've got a special weekend coming up that's going to be focusing on that pretty soon. That's right. We'll tell folks more about it, I think, a little later in our program. Okay. but. Yes, absolutely. Well, before we go to the phone lines, we always mm -hmm. like to start with prayer, and so let's do that now. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time once again when we can open up the Bible and study together. This is your book. 
Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and guide us, that same Spirit that inspired the prophets many years ago. We ask that that Spirit would guide our hearts and our minds, be with those who are listening, wherever they might be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, our first caller this evening, we've got Jerry listening in Texas. Uh, Jerry, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I have a question. In my Bible readings this morning, it refers to Numbers 24 and the interactions between mm -hmm. Balak and Balaam. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was in a um, maybe an insert from an inspired rioter, but I thought I understood that Balak used sorcery in a couple of his attempts. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, well, you have two characters that are mentioned here in the book of Numbers 24, and, and uh, Balaam was a prophet of God. Now, keep in mind, there were some Old Testament prophets. They knew the Lord, and the Lord spoke to them, and they weren't necessarily Jews. Um, you know, Noah was technically a prophet, and he was not a Jew. So in Mesopotamia, there was someone who worshipped the true God. His name was Balaam. But uh, while he started out good, he ended up going bad. Well, he was known to the other kings as a man that God spoke through. And so Balak, knowing that God was with Israel, Balak was the king of the Moabites. He thought, look, if I can't, if I can't defeat them with natural means, I'm going to fight fire with fire. They've got God with them, and maybe I can get a prophet of God to curse them. That was his reasoning. And so he, you know, they were used to back then paying uh, psychics and sorcerers to try to cast spells and they, they told Balaam, will you come cast a spell or curse Israel? And he said, no, God's blessed them. I can't. They kept offering him more and more money, and he got tempted. He wanted the honor and the money they were offering. So he said, well, I, I have to say what the Lord says, but I'll go if you, you, know, if you insist. And so uh, every time he opens his mouth to try to curse Israel, blessings come out. In fact, one of the blessings of Balaam is where it said a star will rise out of Jacob. And it's probably the wise men in Mesopotamia, where Balaam was from, that were reading that when they came searching for the Christ child. So, but Balaam was not using sorcery. Balak, the king of the Moabites, was hoping that he would use some kind of witchcraft or sorcery to curse them. So hopefully that helps a little bit, Jerry. It's a very interesting story where the donkey ends up talking to the prophet. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Next caller that we have is Isaiah listening in Texas. Isaiah, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Yes, hello. Thank you, pastors, for both taking my call. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And your question? Hey, um, yes, yes, sir. My question is um, referring to Acts twenty six twenty four. Mm -hmm. It's referring over to uh, when Paul was feeling beside himself. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I guess with all the learning, it was driving him insane. Could you please elaborate on that? Please? Yeah. I, um, Paul is making his defense before Festus, who is one of the Roman rulers that is going to decide whether or not to set him free or to punish him or to send him to Rome. And as Paul is talking to him about Jesus and the resurrection a Festus says, Paul, you're beside yourself. Beside yourself is a term that's used to mean you've lost your mind. And he's saying, you're beside yourself. Much learning has driven you mad. Paul was very educated. And he said, you spent too much time reading the prophecies and you're getting caught up in it and you're not balanced. You've gone mad. So, well, Paul was not beside himself and he was not uh, crazy. And, and though he was very wise. And so... He goes on to say in verse 25, I am not mad, most noble Felix, Festus, but I'm speaking the words of truth and reason for the king before whom, whom I also speak. And he's talking there to Agrippa. He said, he knows the words that I say are true. So there's a couple of rulers that are listening to him. And, and uh, one of them talks about the resurrection. He says, you're crazy. You know, if you look at that same passage, there is a cross-reference where you know, Paul now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, speaking of Christ and Him crucified, he said, to the Jew, it's a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. Yeah. So you can understand how you, know, you have this Roman governor who talks about, well, hears about the resurrection. He says, that that's craziness. You, yeah. You're out of your mind. Paul said, well, to the unbeliever, it's foolishness. But to those of us who are saved, yeah, it's eternal life. You know, it's mm -hmm. a wonderful promise. Good point. So, okay, thank you, Isaiah. We've got uh, Joan listening in Australia. Joan, welcome to Bible Answers Live. 
Hello, thank you for taking my call. My question um, tonight is, where in the Bible does it say we screen or vote people to be members in or out of a church? Well, I don't think you'll find the word uh, vote. Um, the teaching that people need to be clear uh, before they're added, you know, before baptism, Philip asked, I'm sorry, the Ethiopian treasurer asked Philip, and I think this is Acts chapter 8, he said, what prevents me from being baptized? And he said, well, if you believe with all your heart, so one thing is you've got to believe to be part of the church. Um, you need to be willing to obey God's commandments. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, go therefore teach all nations, or certain teaching. Teaching what? He says, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So a person should not be part of the church or be baptized if they don't believe the commandments of God. And then Paul later says that if someone, uh, and Jesus says it also in Matthew 18, if someone will not listen to the authority of the church, then they should be put out and treated like uh, an infidel. I think he says a publican. Uh, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 7 about a man that was sleeping with his stepmother. And he said, you need to put that man out. He was you know, clearly uh, bringing shame on the cause. And uh, so there's a criteria. And then we, when they were baptized in Acts chapter 2, it says they were added to the church. And the term they're added means like brought within the fold. They're becoming part of something. So you see there's a criteria for coming in and for going out. And it's believing the teachings of Jesus. Does that make sense, Joan? Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate your question. All right. We've got Brittany listening in California. Brittany, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Hey, hey. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing, Brittany? I'm pretty good. <laughs> and uh, so what's your question tonight? Yeah, my question is, should a Christian celebrate Sidr Shazad's day? Well, I you know there's there are there are some people that are notable in society. You know, there's uh, Martin Luther King's day. They've got President's Day that is actually honoring both Washington and Lincoln. So when you say celebrate, you know, there's no no religious uh, celebration going on on any of those days. Uh, people might want to, you know, uh, enjoy and commemorate their achievements. But, um, uh, you know, there's no mandate in the Bible to uh, celebrate, uh, I guess, anybody but Jesus. Matter of fact, we don't even really have a command to remember Christmas. That's more of a tradition than a command. So, uh, yeah, the, nothing in the Bible says to celebrate Cesar Chavez Day. So, okay. uh, hey, thanks, Brittany. Hope All that right. helps. We've got Deborah in Canada. Deborah, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Hi, pastors. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for calling. Good. I have a question about the raven, <laughs> the okay. bird, the raven. Yeah. Uh, I know Noah in Genesis 8, 7, let it out of the ark. It was the first bird to let, be let out. Mm -hmm. And in Kings, First Kings, the raven was the ravens were used to feed Elijah. I was just wondering if there was any significance as to why God would choose what we know in the Mosaic Law as an unclean bird. Yeah, th that is interesting. I think that the the reason that the Lord chose the raven is, um, uh, first of all, Elijah and Noah were not told to eat ravens. Um, the ravens are probably, they're in the COVID family, or Corvid family. <laughs> he said COVID. <laughs> Corvid family. And they're the uh, smartest, one of the smartest birds. I think their intelligence is, uh, they say, even above a dog. They know how to use tools. Uh, they live a long time. They grieve when another raven dies. And uh, they can actually, some ravens can learn to mimic certain sounds, like, you know, parrots do. So um, they're extremely bright birds, and I think God guided them into the palace of Ahab to take food from Ahab and bring it to uh, Elijah. I can't prove that, but it's fun to think. So, yeah. And they're, uh, I, what do you call it? Ravens are kind of omnivores, so they could bring almost anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like a hummingbird just going to get nectar. And it's a big bird. so it can They carry, carry yeah, can that's carry true. Things, so. All right, thank you, Deborah. Good point. We've got Gary in Illinois. Gary, welcome to the program. Thank you. Are we entering the first trumpet judgment, you know, considering the recent uh, 
extreme weather like wildfires in Texas and hailstorms. I get this from Revelation 8, 7. Yeah, I don't know, Pastor Ross, you want to address Yeah, I can that? read the verse. It says, and the first angel sounded, and there was hail followed with mingled with blood. And it says they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burnt up, and the green grass was burnt up. So your question is, is this um, a prophecy literally to be fulfilled, meaning that a third of the trees of the earth are to be burnt up and all the green grass, or does it have a symbolic significance? Is, is that correct, Gary? Well, literally, because we're seeing a lot of fires. I mean, Canada had a size of Ohio fire, Maui, Hawaii burnt down, Siberia is even twice as bad. Correct. Well, you know, first of all, in Pastor Day, you share, I, of course, the book of Revelation is a, is a prophetic book, and it's filled with symbols, right, from the very beginning of the book all the way to the end. Uh, you talk mm -hmm. about horses galloping across the sky, and you've got a red horse and a white horse and a black horse and a pale horse, and a lot of symbolism. That Dragon we find with in the seven book. heads. You don't see that every day. Yeah, that's right. And beasts coming <laughs> up from the sea and the earth. And so, yeah, this is part of the trumpets. And the trumpets kind of go through uh, the history from the time of Christ all the way through until our time. And the fifth trumpet, it's got talking about trees being burnt up and green grass being burnt up. In the Bible, trees are often associated with people. And green grass would be a symbol for people once again or large groups of people. It's really talking about a judgment that was to come upon those part of the Roman Empire that had um, persecuted the Christians. There was attacks from the various barbarian tribes that entered the land. You also have the Muslim tribes or the Muslim movement under the Ottoman Empire and the Turks that were coming in, entering into Europe. So uh, that had a broader historical application uh, with reference to this fifth trumpet not so much a literal application, although, you know, the Bible does speak about the earth getting old like a garment and mm -hmm. uh, talks about the sea and the waves roaring as signs connected with the coming of Christ or close to the coming of Christ. And yes, there are changes in our environment, and I think there are signs. The Bible speaks of earthquakes, mm -hmm. in diverse places. So there are things happening in the natural world that are warning signs as to the imminent coming of Christ. Yeah, and of course, um, it tells us in Revelation that God will destroy those that destroy the earth. Mm. And you can just see that the fires and everything that's happening, a lot of them are man-made. And uh, boy, just vast. We were talking about a forest fire up in paradise just before the program, it, how it's just, uh, and that was man-made. It's you know, PG&E, they mm -hmm. determined. Mm -hmm. uh, just totally decimated the countryside. And of course, things are a little different nowadays. Uh, you know, back 100, 200 years ago, these forest fires would burn almost all summer long in the mountains here in California, and they would burn out a lot of the underbrush. Whereas, you know, the in our times, were big we're always, yeah, yeah, we're putting fires out, and so it's only increasing the vegetation that can burn. It's dry, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, things have changed. Yeah, The environment's changed. All right, well, thank you. Appreciate that, Gary. We've got Glenn listening in uh, Ohio. Glenn, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Thanks again for taking my call. Yeah. You know, when God spoke to Noah in the 11th chapter of Genesis, he told him to get busy and replenish the earth. Mm -hmm. And all translations agree with that replenishing of the earth. But when you go to Genesis 1.28, where Yahweh is speaking to Adam and Eve, he tells them also, according to the King James translation, to replenish the earth. I see that as either a blemish in the King James Version of the Bible or something else that needs to be talked about. Can you help me? Yeah, well, uh, when God tells him to fill the, the word I've got, and I'm reading the New King James, he said that they should fill the earth. And, um, you know, God told Adam and Eve, I want you to populate the earth. Originally, they were in the garden. After sin, they were evicted from the garden. Are you thinking that there was maybe a population before Adam and Eve that needed to be replaced? I think that might be worthy of consideration because it's the only translation that talks about the Adam and Eve of re replenishing the earth. Yeah. Well, I think, like I said, this uh, this translation, and by the way, there, the, the King James translation, while it is wonderful, is not perfect. It was done by men. They were not angels that translated the King James Bible. And there are a couple places where they maybe didn't have the best choice of words or there's some inconsistency. This is a place where I think that the word be fruitful and fill the earth is more appropriate because there's nothing in the Genesis record 
that says that there was a civilization before Adam and Eve that needed to be replaced. It goes sequentially from the days of creation to Adam's creation to Eve to the fall. There's no other scenario of some other race that was wiped out that needed to be replaced. That's right. That you can squeeze in there. Sin, the consequence of sin is death. And we know according to the Bible that sin started with Adam and Eve. There's no so death if they were the that. ones, yeah, if they were the ones to replenish the earth, meaning they were to replace a population beforehand that had died, how would they have died if there had been no sin? Mm -hmm. so, Good point. Uh, yeah, and if you look at the other translations, it says, uh, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and yeah. subdue it. So I think that's a, a better translation there. Next caller that we have is Henry listening in New York. Henry, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Uh, yes, how are you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm both of you. My question is... Uh, if you're saved, if you go to heaven and your name is written in the book of life, uh, do you have to take communion before you get into heaven? Is it written anywhere in the Bible before you got to take communion? Well, it, you know, Jesus does say in the, I think it's both the Gospel of Matthew, it's repeated in Second Corinthians, that uh, the Lord's Supper celebrating the, and the Lord's Supper was like an extension of the Passover. The Passover was, you know, this angel of judgment passes over because of the blood of the Lamb. Well, when Jesus comes, we know he is the Passover Lamb. And he said, except you, and I just read it in uh, church this week, um, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, John chapter 6. So that's talking about, it's a symbol for accepting the life of Jesus and that his blood would cleanse us from sin and the teachings of the New Testament, the New Covenant, that's what the, the grape juice is a symbol of. So a believer should want to participate, first of all, in being part of a church family and communion. Now, in our church, sometimes we've got some seniors that, uh, well, I guess every church, you have some people that are shut-ins, they can't make it. And when we have communion, we have elders and pastors that'll go and take it to their home and uh, so that they can participate. But it, there's only a couple of sacred ordinances that Jesus left the church. And one of them is baptism. Of course, you've got marriage, baptism, and you've got the communion service. So it's, it's certainly it's a, a ratification of our faith that should be repeated uh, whenever the church comes together in that capacity. Okay, thank you. Do you have to know it? Do you have to do that to go to heaven? There'll be people in heaven that maybe didn't have an opportunity, mm -hmm. for sure. But why a believer would not want to is a concern. Okay. All right, we got Lloyd in Arkansas. Lloyd, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Hello, thank you for uh, having me on and to answer my question. Yeah. My question is: Is God protecting Satan? And if so, what is he protecting him from? Well, when you say is God protecting Satan, uh, Satan is living under an impending judgment and satan is also he is restricted in what he can access the bible tells us in revelation 12 that satan was cast down to the earth so the devil's rebellion against god has been limited to our planet and so as far as god protecting him well god gives all of his creatures life uh, and people that choose to turn away from god their initial life comes from god he doesn't God does not exterminate somebody as soon as they say, I don't love you anymore. Otherwise, we see half the, more than half the population would expire right away. So people are sustained by God. Um, he's the one who gives grace to the people that even curse him. They couldn't live or take another breath or have another heartbeat without God. So in that sense, the devil is still sustained by the initial life God gave him. But the devil is not being protected by God. I don't think he needs much protection as, as far as... Uh, He's the highest of the angels. There's no other angel that's harassing him in that way. So, I don't know. My, hopefully, I'm answering your question, Lloyd. Question for me, Pastor. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much. You take care. All right. Next caller that we have is E. Frank in New York. E. Frank, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Yes. Uh, good evening, Pastor Doug and Pastor uh, Ross. I have a question in regards to uh, the Bible, uh, where it's uh, about um, 
issue, an issue that has to do with um, how you believe in Jesus uh, on, on certain occasions. Uh, there's this South African woman who told me that the way Jesus revealed himself during the persecution of Herod in Africa, that she has the right to celebrate and display a understanding of her symbolic uh, adherence to what Jesus did in uh, in Namur. Now, I have always believed in in the what Jesus preached in the, in Galilee, and I just want to know, Pastor Doug, in the Bible, does it say that we have to wear any type of apparel or indicative uh, symbols? Uh, uh, indicating that we're Christians and we believe in God and the Bible that way, because in the Bible it says that uh, Master um, only, uh, well, Jesus said Master, or in the other way around, only it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than than someone who is poor. Yeah. So. All right, so is there any criteria on what we should or shouldn't wear given in the Bible? You know, God does not uh, order us to wear a particular costume. Now, when the priests in the Old Testament, there was a certain apparel that the priests would wear. Of course, the purpose of the Old Testament temple has been fulfilled. When Christ died on the cross, the veil was rent. Jesus said, your house has left you desolate. And so the, the uh, uh, Aaronic priesthood right now does not exist in that they're not sacrificing lambs. So there's no uniform there are principles that God gives in his word for every believer. And those principles have to do with uh, neatness, modesty. Uh, the Bible tells us that you know we, we should uh, not be wearing, and this is men and women, should not be adorned with the outward adorning of gold and, and apparel and costly ray. And uh, Paul talks about you know women wearing pearls and having elaborate hairdos. Uh, you know, God's people shouldn't dress so frumpy that we attract attention is because, because of our being out of date, but we also shouldn't try and be impressing people with our money by the clothes we wear. There should be humility in that. Neat, clean, modest, those are the principles that God shares. we got a book on that, by the way, on um, jewelry. How much is too much a person can get when they call the uh, resource line? The number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for that book. It's called Jewelry, How Much is Too Much? And we'll be happy to send it to anyone in Canada or the U.S., so call them ask. All right, friends, we're getting ready for our halftime break. So we want to encourage you to pay attention to these important messages that are coming. We'll be back taking more Bible questions in just a few moments. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit BibleHistory.com. Jerusalem, the city of peace, has been a place of unending conflict for centuries. Many now believe that Jerusalem will soon take center stage again. But what does the Bible say? The Fall and Rise of Jerusalem presents the vital history you need to know about Jerusalem and its role in end-time Bible prophecy. This Amazing Facts edition of the classic volume, The Great Controversy, is the perfect sharing book. Get your copy at afbookstore.com. If I was to place a target on all of the time of human history, the bullseye would land on the final week of Jesus' earthly life. The cross of Christ is the axis on which human history revolves. That's why I want you to know about an exciting upcoming Amazing Facts Bible Summit, the Glory of the Cross Summit. It'll be a special two-day event that explores the final chapters of Jesus' earthly ministry. So I hope you'll plan now to join me and our lineup of other inspiring pastors from the Granite Bay Hilltop Church starting Friday, March 29th through March 30th. If you can't join us in person, don't worry. We'll broadcast the entire event on AFTV, Facebook, and YouTube. Friends, this is going to be a wonderful Easter event for the whole family. 
Be sure to register and get ready to embark on a journey that'll deepen your love and devotion for Jesus. We'll see you there. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. And if you have tuned in somewhere along the way, this is, as the title hints, a live international interactive Bible study. You can give us a call. Call if you have a Bible question. The number is 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297 with your Bible questions. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross, and we have a number of folks who are standing by with their Bible question. But, Pastor Doug, before we go to the phone lines, you know, we noticed that here in the little break, we played mm -hmm. a commercial about a very exciting event that's coming up at the end of March. So, what, about three, four weeks away? Three weeks away. Um, it's called the Glory of the Cross, and it's focused on those last few uh, events connected with the life of Christ. talks yes. about his trial, uh, Gethsemane, his trial, his crucifixion, the resurrection, and then the gospel going out to the world. We're looking forward to this, and we want to tell folks they can tune in and they can participate in this mm -hmm. very special event. Yeah, I think uh, the, the subtitle is From the Upper Room Through the Tomb. Mm. So we're taking the, the closing couple of days and the events connected with this. It's really the, the cross and the events around the cross are the axle on which the uh, gospel, indeed all history, rotates. It's, uh, this is a central point where you have God's power of love and the devil's love for power, and they all kind of came to a head at this, this great, uh, those days of destiny. So we're going to be talking about that during the Easter season and invite people to join us for the Glory of the Cross program. If you're in the Sacramento area, come in person. Otherwise, join us online. Again, we want to remind you of our free offer for, that we have. It talks about the cross. It's called The High Cost of the Cross. And we want to send that to anyone who calls and asks. The number is 800-835-6747. You can ask for The High Cost of the Cross, just offer number 156. You can also receive a digital download of that book by simply dialing pound 250 on your smartphone, say Bible Answers Live, and then ask for The High Cost of the Cross, and we'll be able to send you a digital copy of the book. You can read it. You can share it with somebody else. I'm going to go back to the phone lines. We've got Preston listening in Texas, and he's got a question about watching Christian programs. Preston, welcome to the program. Hello. Hi. Thanks for calling. Uh, yes. So my question was, uh, uh, watching, uh, is it wrong for Christians to watch Christian uh, programs like The Chosen, the TV show The Chosen? All right. Well, um well, I'm a little biased if you ask about watching Christian programs because we're producing one at this very moment. So there's no sin in taking in spiritual material, whether you're reading or whether you're watching or listening. Uh, TV is just one of the mediums that communicates. And so uh, that's a very powerful medium. At the same time, you want to um, you know, have a filter about what you do and don't watch. There are some Christian programs out there that I don't watch. They're... You know, these pastors, quite frankly, that they, they're doing this prosperity gospel. I think it's extortion of a, a type, spiritual extortion. And uh, you notice we don't spend a lot of time begging for money on this program and promising people fame and fortune and health and wealth if they do. So I, there's some things I won't watch because I just think they're so unbiblical. There's some good ministries and ministers out there. I don't expect them to agree with me in every point. And they, they've got a lot of great uh, material and so you kind of eat the melon and you spit out the seeds. And they probably feel that way about me. Um, now, when you're talking about The Chosen, and I've only seen, a, to be honest, a few excerpts. Um, I, I've found in my own experience, Pastor Ross may have some thoughts on this, that when Hollywood tries to recreate Jesus or biblical stories, they almost never can get close to the real thing. Or it's always uh, distorted in, in one way or the other. I have some good things come out of that. Well, I'm sure there are people that haven't thought about the life and teachings of Jesus that watch this, and you could point to some good things. Um, I, but personally, 
uh, I, I think that there's a, a danger when we we start getting our information about Christ in his ministry. From what I've known, someone told me I should watch it. I watched a little bit, and uh, I saw right away they were embellishing the story with things that were not in the Bible, which is always suspect. But, uh, you know, I'm not here to condemn. I, I commend people that are trying to communicate the gospel. I don't know. That's a rambling answer. But <laughs> any thoughts? If you want to no, ramble, I agree, you Pastor. I, you know, it's uh, you go out on a limb I with think, me. Well, <laughs> I think they actually they they actually say that they're not trying to be perfectly faithful to you know what the Bible says. They do take liberties to kind of add in, and uh, you know, there's some extra stories added, extra personalities added that's not in the gospel account. And uh, on the one hand, you've got to be careful because, you know, the Bible talks about a really true story, something that mm -hmm. really happened. When you read about the gospel, you read about Christ, you read about the apostles, that, that's history. That's, mm -hmm. that's real. You don't want to create the scene where that almost becomes a, more of a novel type scenario. So, yeah, I, I agree, Pastor. We've got to be careful. You can start embellishing on the, yeah. the truth and people can get distracted by the embellishment. Yeah, that's true. And miss the main point. So... All right, thank you, Preston. A verse in the Bible, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, and he goes on to say, dwell on these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, next caller that we have is Sandra listening in Pennsylvania, and she's got a question about Joshua and the angel that you read about in Zechariah yeah. 3. Sandra, welcome to the program. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Good evening. Hi there. Um, so the other day, um, recently I heard a sermon in regards to Zechariah chapter 3, um, wonderful sermon, And but I was a little confused as to who Joshua is mm -hmm. and who the angel of the Lord is, because I always thought that Joshua represents Christ and that also the angel of the Lord also represents Christ pre-incarnate. Mm -hmm. So um, I was just trying to figure out, you know, who's represented in that chapter. All right, good. Well, in Zechariah chapter 3, uh, there's a vision. It says, He showed me Joshua, this is verse 1, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose, or that word is to accuse him. You go to Revelation chapter 12, it calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And in the book of Job, there's the devil accusing Job before God. And the devil is our accuser and Christ is our defense attorney. So the angel of the Lord is the one that rebukes the devil in Zechariah. Now, there really was a high priest in Israel during Zechariah's time, and his name was Joshua. It's interesting. The name Joshua is the name Jesus in Hebrew. It's actually Yeshua. And you've got Joshua who led the children of Israel into the promised land. He's like our general and our, um, our judge. And then you've got Joshua, the high priest, that led the children of Israel from Babylon back to the promised land. So they're both types of Christ. And the priest would bear the sins of the people. So Joshua's got these dirty clothes because of the sins of the people and the devil's accusing. And in the story, his filthy clothes are taken away by the angel of the Lord and he's given clean garments and it's a symbol of the cleansing from sin. So you're pretty close from what you said, Sandra, to uh, having a right interpretation. I'm not sure what you may have heard someone else say, but... Um, yeah, this is a story about the plan of salvation. It tells us that uh, the angel of the Lord stood by and he said, uh, you can read in verse 6, Now if you'll walk in my ways, this is after his filthy garments are taken away, if you'll walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, then you will judge my house, likewise have charge of my courts, and I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. In other words, you'll be here in heaven. So it's a wonderful promise. So in this parable, or in this chapter, in this vision, Joshua would represent the people, mm -hmm. and the angel of the Lord would represent Christ. Right. But like you say, there's, there's almost a dual application, because yes, our high priest is Jesus. Mm -hmm. But in this context, Joshua represents the people. Right. Okay, very good. Thank you. Good question, Sandra. We've got Charlie listening in Arizona, and he has a question about Exodus chapter 20, verse 10. Charlie, welcome to the program. Hi, guys. How are you this evening? Good. How can we help you? <coughs> Exodus 20, uh, verse 10. Okay. I'm sorry, I got cold. All right. It it says that God created the, everything in six days. Right. And you have to rest on the Sabbath. And he starts listening, listening, listening uh -huh. 
you know what I mean, making a list of, you know, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your female servant, your cattle, everything. But there's no mention of a wife. Do Is there a reason why? Well, yeah, I think that uh, husbands and wives are included in the admonition. When God gives the Ten Commandments, it tells us that the men and women wash their clothes, husbands and wives, and they came before the Lord, and they heard the Lord saying these words audibly. So the command is not just given to the man. The commandment is given to the, the parents. That's why later it says, honor your father and your mother. And so I think it's understood that... Uh, yeah, people are to rest from their regular labor. There is a verse earlier where it says, bake what you're going to bake and boil what you're going to boil. And ostensibly, you know, the, the women were doing a lot of the cooking back then. and They were to be resting. They were to get that work done ahead of time. So the command's all-encompassing, I think, for the family. Mm -hmm. The stranger, the cattle, everybody was to rest. And it does appear that, you know, when it specifically mentions the list, like you say, your son, your daughter, your servants a male servant, female servant, your cattle, the stranger is within your gates. It's, it's people under your, um, under your control, uh, yeah. those who you can direct. And uh, definitely that would include all of the members of the family. Well, he's got a point. It's hard to direct your wife, though. Well, yep, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I retract sometimes. that last <laughs> statement. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, would, uh, it would include everyone in your household. Right. Is the idea behind that. All right, thank you, Charlie. We've got uh, Giovanni listening from Idaho, and he's got a question from Deuteronomy 3.3. Giovanna, welcome to the program. Hi there, pastors. How are hey. you this evening? Great, thank you. Um, awesome. So my question is actually in regards to Deuteronomy 23.3. Okay. And um, it's about david and how he is king and i'm just kind of wondering how he's king when ruth is a moabite right let me read this for our friends that are listening uh the moabites had attacked the israelites and gave them a hard time and so there was a curse pronounced on them and you can read in genesis i'm sorry in deuteronomy 23 3 an ammonite or a moabite shall not enter the assembly of the lord even to the tenth generation none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the lord forever because they did not meet you with bread or water on the road when you came out of Egypt, because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pithor of Mesopotamia to curse you. Um, and yet, Ruth, and it has not been 10 generations from when this was given. No, I don't think it had been. Um, yeah, I can almost trace the genealogy from Boaz was the son of Salmon, who was the, more, maybe one of the spies of Joshua. So yeah, it wasn't 10 generations yet. And... Um, Yet she was a Moabite, and then she is the grandmother, or the great-grandmother, of David. So, um, and she was allowed into the congregation. The, the command does not eclipse an earlier command that if someone converted to the God of uh, the Israelites, that they were welcome. And so Ruth, she said, your God is my God. Mm -hmm. So she converted. And um, they had that law that, it's saying you could be friends with a Moabite up until they did this. They could have stayed Moabites, but and you could do business with them. But after they uh, tried to curse Israel, there was a curse pronounced for 10 generations. How long would that be? 40 times 10, 400 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good question. Uh, let's see. We've got um, Regina listening in Oregon. Regina, welcome to the program. Hi, thank uh, you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I do have a question. Actually, I've been asking this question myself, but I did not know how to answer. Mm -hmm. Myself, I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and someone asking asking me in Geneva, in Geneva when God uh, created Lucifer because he did create the Lucifer. When Lucifer chose to do the wrong, where did he know the that wrong? Where is the wrong coming from? You know. How did how do because God created only the right things, love and everything, everything was perfect. Where where how did you? Okay, I'm sorry. How did he know to pick the wrong? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I know what you mean, Regina. Um, yeah, um, of course God made everything good. The Bible tells us in James, every good and perfect gift uh, comes from God, and Jesus said God is good, and God does not tempt, neither is he tempted. God cannot do anything bad. 
uh, because he is perfect and he's good. So God made good creatures, but he made them with, they're, they're built with a risky freedom. And that freedom to love is given to all of his intelligent creatures. And Lucifer was given the same freedom to love. But in order to love, you've got to have the ability to choose to not love. God can't make you with forced love built in. It ceases to be love. If you can't choose it, you become a robot. So Lucifer was given this. He chose to love himself more than God. And it, he just kept nurturing that. And it probably went from a, an early inclination. He knew something was wrong. But he kept cherishing this self-love until he, pretty soon he put himself on the throne and he wanted to destroy God. And he became ruled by selfishness. God is love. Satan, in a word, is selfish. And it's all about his pride and his selfishness. So, um, yeah, God made him per perfect. He made him free. He chose to love himself more and he became corrupt through it. And we've got a study guide. It's called, Did God Create a Devil? Right. And it answers all of these questions. It's a good, great study. And we mm -hmm. want to encourage anyone who wants to learn more about this, just call and ask. The number is 800-835-6747. You can ask the study guide. It's called, Did God Create the Devil? You can also dial pound 250 on your smartphone and say, Bible Answers Live, and then ask for that study guide. Mm -hmm. Did God Create a Devil? We'll send it to you. Study it, and you'll be blessed. Next caller that we have is Eric, and he's listening in Colorado, and he has a question about spirits. Uh, Eric, welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you for taking the call. Yes. Um, I see and hear spirits. Does this mean that I'm lost? You he hear and see spirits. Uh, well, it means yeah. the devil. The devil's probably trying to get you. Of course, he's trying to get everybody. But, um, you know, I think there are some godly people in the, devil, in the Bible that uh, they saw spirits that the devil was trying to spook them. And so because the devil's trying to harass you or frighten you does not automatically mean you're lost. Uh, it means that the devil's trying to distract you or confuse you or frighten you. Um, whether you are saved or lost is something that you and the Lord only know. If, if you've um, come to Jesus and surrendered your life to Jesus, then uh, keep your eyes fixed on him. If the devil comes around, in the name of the Lord, rebuke the devil. Do not give him ground. If there's something in your life that's opening the door to the devil, you know, I, I've got a friend that was seeing all kinds of spooks and demons, and they spent all their time watching scary movies, these diabolical movies. And I thought, well, no wonder. You're watching ghost movies, and uh, you're kind of opening the door to the devil. Mm -hmm. So close any avenues in your life where you're creating a bridge for the devil to come in and haunt or, or tempt or frighten you. And um, reconsecrate your life to the Lord every day. Paul said, I die daily. That means you've got to be born again every day. Okay, great. Thank Thanks. you. We've got uh, Corette listening from Connecticut. And Corette has a question about working on Sabbath. Corette, yes. welcome to the program. Good night, Pastor. Evening. Good night. Yes, I was asking, when is it okay to work on the Sabbath? Well, uh there are obviously Christian hospitals that have people they care for. You know, Jesus said it's better to do good on the Sabbath day. And so if you're ministering to somebody who's struggling with some dire sickness, then that's appropriate. You know, I know dentists that uh, they love the Lord, but they'll get a call from someone that's in agony from a toothache. They'll On the Sabbath day, they'll open their shop, usually free of charge, and they'll go and, and either help them right then or at least help them with some temporary relief where they can do major surgery or whatever they need later. I don't know of any dentist that will say, let me adjust your braces, because that's kind of an elective thing that you can schedule another day. But when someone's in pain or suffering, if someone's in the hospital, they need doctors, nurses, and people to care for them. Um, my wife is a physical therapist, and she hasn't worked uh, in a hospital for years, but when she did, some people had surgery on Friday, and they needed to have physical therapy immediately the next day. And so she would work, and she would not keep that pay. She'd just donate it to the Lord. So uh, there are emergency situations. You know, if, if you're a fireman, you should try to schedule your Sabbath free. Let someone else be on duty then so you can rest. But if <laughs> there's a forest fire, you hop in your truck, and you go save people. So even the Jews, when they're attacked, at, uh, attacked on their Sabbath day, the soldiers can't say, well, we'll start defending the country when the sun goes down. So there are emergency situations, but they should be the rare exception and not the rule. Um, does that make sense, Corette? 
Yes, it does. All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. Thanks for your question. All right. Next caller that we have is Larry, listening in Michigan. Larry, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi, Larry. Thanks for calling. Yeah, um, I got a question. How does a person know? Because I know in Matthew, Jesus was talking about those who speak against the Spirit, you know, their unparable sin. But how does a person really know if they committed it? Because sometimes I wonder, um, but yet I feel guilty about a lot of things. So I'm, I'm a little confused. And when I ask for forgiveness, I sometimes, like, is that real? I got questions about that. Mm -hmm. So I just like to know if, about the, the um, I just hope I didn't like push the Holy Spirit away for that, you know. Well, you know, every time we sin, we may grieve the Holy Spirit, but that does not mean you grieved it away where it's unforgivable. Uh, so the very fact you're calling means the Holy Spirit is striving in your heart. Uh, so I, I would not be worried that you've committed the unpardonable sin. I would be concerned. Uh, God wants you to have peace. Uh, the Lord wants you to believe that he will forgive your sins and that he'll give you power to live a new life. You know, Christ doesn't ask us to do anything without giving us the power to do it. When God says, repent, come to me, I'll give you rest, you turn from your sins, you confess your sins, and he says, I'll give you peace and rest and victory and a new life. You believe that. And uh, you're, you're going to have peace and you'll have evidence in your life that God is working in your life and that will confirm the promises of God also. You know, we have a book, Pastor Doug, it's called What is the Unpardonable Sin? And there you we go. would encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, the number to call is 800-835-6747 and just ask for it. It's called What is the Unpardonable Sin? We'll mail it to you or you can just dial pound 250 on your cell phone, mm -hmm. say Bible Answers Live and then ask for the book by name. What is the unpardonable sin? We got Joyce in Florida. Uh, Joyce, welcome to the program. We have just a few moments, but you have a question about uh, the punishment of the wicked. Yes, praise the Lord. I love your program. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, I would like to know: um, Will there be degrees of punishment in hell? And if so, where is that uh, located in the Bible? Well, I'm looking it up for you right now. Uh, yes, there will be differences. Uh, S-D-R-I-P. I added an extra letter in there. Hang on here. I'm typing something in my computer. I just can't spell. Luke 12, 48. You found it. Is that the one? You beat me. Well, <laughs> no, I'm looking at Luke 12. Yeah, 47, 48. Yep. It says, that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, he will beaten with, be beaten with many stripes. And then it also says that those that did not know their master's will are beaten with few stripes. So stripes are when they used to whip a person that would leave stripes on their back, and that was a whipping, really. And so Jesus is basically saying those who were guilty for much suffer more than those who were less accountable and did not know. So, uh, uh, yes, there are varying degrees of reward, and so there are varying degrees of punishment. Um, Jesus says in one of the last verses in the Bible, Behold, I come, my reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. So Adolf Hitler is going to suffer more than people of uh, lesser crimes. So hopefully that helps. Uh, you with us, Joyce? Does that make sense? Give out the enlightenment. All right. You're, you're uh, welcome. God bless. And we thank you for your call. Uh, Pastor Ross, we have time for one more quick one. All right, we've got Ron Before. listening in, uh, let's see, Alabama. Ron, welcome to the program. Yes, good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Yeah. Uh, my question has to do with Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, yeah. uh, and mentioned in Genesis 34. Could she somehow represent the church, you know, how you have literal Israel and the tribes, the children of Israel, then you have spiritual Israel. Could Dinah represent the spiritual body of the church yeah being one of jacob's you know descendants yeah i think you're on to something and the story that uh, ron is referring to is found there in genesis 34 where dinah the only daughter listed of jacob's children everyone else was a son that when they were living near shechem she went out to visit the other ladies of the land and maybe do some shopping and a young man uh, took her and i don't think he raped her but he took advantage of her and he said he wanted to marry her, he loved her. 
But um, that's kind of what the pagans had done to the Israelites. Through intermarriage, they kind of lost their purity. And so there is an analogy there, very perceptive, Ron. Uh, I've never actually preached on that, but just as I was listening to you talk, I think there's more there under the surface. And you never hear that uh, Dinah got married again, and it doesn't really tell about her having a family after that. So it, it t changed the course of her life. Listening friends, you know, in just a moment, we're going to sign off and say farewell to those listening on satellite radio. And then um, those of you who are listening on land-based stations, we always stay on for a few more minutes to do rapid-fire Bible questions that come in via the Internet. So you can email us questions. Some people have questions, but they say, oh, I'm afraid to, to get on the air. Well, you can email your questions. We'll take a few of them at the end of each program, and you'll see the number there on the screen. The email address is balquestions at amazingfacts.org. But before we say farewell to the audience at large, you know, we do these programs because we want to share the good news. And that good news is that God sent his son into the world to take the punishment for all the sins of the world. And he wants you to be in his kingdom. He desperately wants you to be saved. But we need to make a decision to say, Lord, uh, I'm not doing a very good job running my life. I'm willing to surrender my life to you. I believe you have a plan for me. I would like to be forgiven of my sins. It's our prayer that everybody listening will do that even right now. Make that decision. Then go and sign up for the Amazing Facts Bible Study course at amazingfacts.org. We'll be back for the others. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California. Hello, friends, and welcome back again to our email Bible questions. Pastor Dave, we've got a few great questions this evening. And, of course, if you'd like to send us an email Bible question, it's balquestions at amazingfacts.org. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6 says that God repented. But Numbers 23, 19 says that God does not repent. How do we explain this? Yeah, well, I, I think that different things are being meant here. When it says in Genesis 6 that God repented, it's talking about when sin was in the world, it grieved God in his heart, and he was sorry. Not sorry because he had sinned, but he was sorry that he'd made man, his plan for the paradise, and man to have this happiness, and man made in his creatures sin, and the devil had uh, totally interrupted that, and there was just misery on the planet and violence. And so that grieved God in his heart. That's different from uh, God uh, saying, oops, I made a mistake in repenting in that respect. Um, God knows everything. Nothing surprises him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and God doesn't repent for sin because he does not sin. He's pure and perfect. Okay. Next question that we have is, I believe Christians are discouraged to drink alcohol. But why does God ask for an alcoholic beverage in Numbers 28, verse 7, as part of the sacrifices? Yeah, when it talks about the drink offering, it's not talking about an alcoholic drink. They would offer grape juice. And even Christ at the Last Supper, he made it clear that the, the grape juice that he was offering the disciples was not fermented. Uh, he said, in the kingdom, you'll drink this with me new. And that's in Matthew 26, I believe. So uh, we also have a book called Alcohol and the Christian that'll answer that question if you want a free copy. Again, that number is 800-835-6747. Just ask for it. It's called Alcohol and the Christian. All right, next question. Uh, why is it that Jesus lost his ability to be omnipresent, although he still is omnipotent and omniscient now that he's in heaven? Yeah, well, Jesus is omnipresent in the sense that he said, uh, wherever the Holy Spirit is, he is. Mm -hmm. He said, everybody listening right now, when we accept him, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So while Christ took on human form in his body through his omniscience, his all-knowing, he can be everywhere all at one time. But you just think about the incredible sacrifice that he made in that he will forever be married to the human family because of his love for us and the sacrifice that he made. So uh, that's a wonderful thing to consider. And friends, we look forward to studying with you more in the uh, coming weeks. So just make sure and go to amazingfacts.org and study and continue to listen to Bible Answers Live. Bible Answers Live honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions. 